Our next guest is Keith Gottsdiene, uh, who is the Vice President of Clinical Research for Merck. Keith also leads the Clinical Infectious Diseases and Vaccine Area and is responsible for the development of Merck's infectious disease and vaccine products from early clinical studies all the way through late clinical development, registration, and including the life cycle management of the drugs. He is responsible for over 40 clinical programs and products, including Gardasil. Some of you may be familiar with Gardasil, particularly if you have a teenage daughter. Uh, in fact, today, Keith, I believe, is going to go on and, and tell us the story about Gardasil and the HPV virus. And uh, as, as I mentioned, as a father of a teenage daughter, I'm, I'm very uh, enthused about listening to this because my daughter was vaccinated, so I'd <laughs> like to know what's going to happen. Good. So first of all, thanks very much for having me here, Larry. For the life of me, I can't understand why you actually invited me in line of the topics that are actually here in front of us. But I'm always happy to come to talk about Gardasil um, and many of the, the vaccines that uh, Merck is currently developing. Um, you know, this is a story that uh, I'm going to tell today that has the same kind of passion that we just heard from Pat. It isn't quite the same story because it's kind of a public health passion. So, I, you know, I'm, I'm not going to be able to share the individual stories that Pat does. And, and I, I don't want to downplay that, but in some ways, it's a different side of medicine. It's that prevention of disease as opposed to dealing with the aspect of disease. But I can promise you the people at Merck and many of the people who are involved in this story are just as passionate about that story um, in, in much the same way um, and feel that the value is, is quite the same as well. Um, I, I have to tell you that I'm a very, very small part of this story. So um, I'm not going to do an acknowledgment at the end, but I just wanted to let you know that I've only put a few people here who really told the story. And my role in it was to step in in the middle of this story and to try to help actualize some important parts. And today, actually, I don't run anymore the, the parts that, of Merck that does ID and vaccines. I've moved beyond that for better or for worse. Um, so many of the people who are really continuing this story really provided the slides and the things here. Having said that, though, the story I'm, I'm going to tell, these are my choices about what I wanted to do, and it doesn't really represent any of the thoughts of these individual people. Um, I, as I talk, though, I have to tell you, I am an unabashed, okay, through and through, no ifs, ands, and buts, supporter of vaccination. I trained as an infectious disease doc. Much of my work was done in tropical medicine and in neglected diseases. And I just put this slide up because I had to just spend one minute talking about what an impact vaccination has done. If one takes a look at the 20th century peak morbidity and mortality there, you know, a million kids in the United States, and these weren't only kids, I should point out, but a million people in the United States were dying every year of these during periods of the 20th century. And some of these are not that far away. The, peak, the last peak polio epidemic occurred in the year of my birth. My parents told me what it was like for my mother to walk around pregnant during that time with masks over her face because pregnant women were thought to be particularly susceptible to polio. And when I was, in fact, a, a resident, uh, did much pediatrics, though I'm not trained formally in pediatrics, H. influenza uh, meningitis was a very common thing. And so all winter long, you would see kids come in over and over and over again with serious bacterial meningitis. By the time they came in, many of them were really more abundant. And a large number of them actually died despite all our treatments. Today, you go to a pediatric emergency room and you ask them, have they ever seen, ever seen a case of H. flu meningitis? And the answer is really no. Um, you know, despite that, the vaccine industry has really changed. Let me interrupt real quick and sure. just move your mic up here. You know, it's very strange. Usually people have no problem hearing what I have to say, but that's good to know. Um, it's really changed. It's really come down to six large suppliers of vaccines in the United States and a bunch of small companies as well. I don't think that's necessarily a healthy thing that's actually occurred, but it is a change that's been going on. And so much of the vaccine development that occurs today actually occurs in the context of large pharma. And today, you know, it's become very... Um, fashionable to beat up large pharma. And at the end, you'll all have your chance to ask me those questions that uh, large pharma never likes hearing. Um, but I hope today I can tell you a little bit about the role that we can really play to make a program like this work. I should also point out Merck, I'm very proud of Merck's history in vaccines. 
we've been lucky enough, or we're lucky enough, to have a wonderful person, Maurice Hilleman, who really led the development of vaccines at Merck. And this is just a list of the vaccines that Merck individually has developed from 1940s all the way to 2006. And it isn't just vaccines. These are our infectious disease products, because we lump vaccines and infectious disease products together. And I can tell you that many of these products made an important contribution to medical therapeutics. But having said that, the advertisement is over. Everything else I'm going to tell you today is really about the story itself. Um, so first of all, HPV, uh, human papillomavirus, you know, is a really big disease. 5.5 million people are infected every year in the United States. 20 million people are currently infected. 9.2 million sexually active adolescents and young adults currently infected. The average pre prevalence rate for an HPV uh, type of infection is 75% uh, currently in the United States. And despite that, um, if you want to know what I learned about HPV as I went through my training, I just have to share it with you. So I made a slide that, 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 that enumerates how many times was HPV a topic of instruction when I was in medical school, when I was an intern, when I was a fellow in infectious disease and in my early academic career. As a matter of fact, I don't think I ever heard a mention of HPV disease until I actually got to Merck in 1995. And by that point, I was an associate professor at Columbia doing quite a bit of research in virology and other related areas. So it does say something about this story. On the other hand, um, it isn't just a problem for the United States as we talk about that. This is 630 million people infected worldwide. And you can see there's many countries, including in the developing world, where the prevalence of HPV vaccine is even greater. Now, what really changed the sort of what the story of HPV vaccine is when people realized that HPV infection is a necessary cause of cervical cancer. So the story I'm going to tell you is really going to be a story. It's the first steps on a story to the eradication of cervical cancer. And what we found out is, is that, uh, and certainly I had nothing to do with this story, but persistent cervical infection with certain types of HPV types is the single most important risk for cervical cancer. Now, as you start to think about HPV, there are a couple of things you really need to think about, and a couple of them I've really mentioned. It's the most common sexually transmitted in infection worldwide. It's certainly vying for one of the commonest transmitted infections as well. It's a potent, a potent carcinogen. So for cervical cancer, it is the only known cause. If you don't get infected with HPV, you do not get cervical cancer, period. On the other hand, it plays an important role in many, many other cervical cancers, vaginal, vulvar, anal, and also those of the aerodigestive tract, sort of the back of your throat and your pharynx, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, where it only represents part of things. So the story I'm going to tell you today isn't only about, you know, Gardasil or other cervical HPV vaccines. Merck's not the only one that makes such a vaccine, and much of what I'm going to tell you today also is important for the, the category of vaccine families. Um, but it's also something for your sons these days as well, as I'll show you some of the information. Now, people say, geez, what do you need a vaccine for this? You know, we have pap testing. And clearly, pap testing works. Pap testing really picks up these pre-malignant lesions as we go forward. But with all the organized programs that we currently have, pap testing has reduced cancer rates for about 70 75%. And I'll share some of the costs involved with that um, as well. But HPV also causes benign tumors as well. You know, genital warts, um, I won't ask in, a, in an audience like this how many people have had genital warts. <laughs> Larry's pointing to Tom Check here next to him. <laughs> But I'm going to show you in a minute on a slide that one out of eight people in this room has had genital warts in their lifetime. Okay, so that's quite a lot of people in here. And I can speak from experience as an infectious disease doctor. You might actually wish you were dead if you had a genital wart, as opposed to actually worrying about mor morbidity and mortality. But more serious are something called recurrent respiratory papillomatosis. These are huge warts of actually the larynx. And so these are warts that continually recur. And in most children's hospital centers, there are whole teams developed to treating this fairly rare disease. Probably about two to 3,000 kids get this a year. But they have to go through 10 years of surgery in many cases, recurrent over and over again to remove these things. So their larynx get blocked up, and they actually die of suffocation um, before things go on. So I mentioned to you that, cervical, you know, that HPV disease is common. Cervical cancer, cancer is common as well. Almost half a million new cases and almost 200,000 deaths annually. 
it affects really a very important population. It's women 30 to 50, so really in their peak productivity. And the pap testing has reduced this by 75%. But in the US, for example, to go from 40,000 to 10,000 cases of cervical cancer a year, which is how many we have in the US, it takes 50 million pap tests annually to yield 2.5 million pap tests abnormalities. And if you've ever been in that situation where you or a loved one has actually got one of those horrible calls from a gynecologist that says, there's something wrong with your pap test, please come back. We have stuff to do. You can understand that that's not a minor thing. To, to 1.2 million cases of pre-cancer, 300,000 surgeries, and the cost is at least 4 to $6 billion a year. Now, as I said to you, the lifetime risk is pretty high. Any HPV infection, half the people in this room. SIN1, which is just a long technical name for sort of the earliest precancerous lesion that you can see in a cervix, one in six. Very high grade premalignant lesions, SIN2 or 3, one in 25. And it gives you some of the numbers for pap testing and for genital warts as well. This is a real problem, okay? This is not a hypothetical problem that everybody should be thinking about. You know, I can sort of hide in my corner and think that, you know, I or my son or my daughter is not really at risk for that. Everybody in this room, everybody who I speak to, really has real risks involved with this. And it isn't just females. Actually, in the United States today, there's almost 10,000 cancers in males that are thought to be HPV related. It's almost identical to the numbers in females. They're in the oral pharynx, the larynx, the anal canal, the penis, etc. Now, this is the actual virus. There are 200 types. That makes a lot of problems when developing a vaccine, because it turns out the immunology or the, the, uh, the, the immune response is very type specific um, as one goes forward. And so we generally um, categorize these, these types into low risk and high risk. Low risk types, two of which are in the vaccine 6 and 11, cause the genital warts and the low grade lesions. So they can show up with precancerous lesions, but they never go on, as far as we know, to actually form cervical cancer. On the other hand, the high risk types, 16 and 18, are the two that are in the vaccine as well. There are four types in the vaccine. Um, they're the ones that actually go on in some portion of people into to cervical cancer. And, and the way this works has really um, been wonderful science. This infects the normal cervix. It sets up an infection down at the base of the cervical uh, you know, uh, epithelium. It sheds for a period of time, and I'm going to show you the life cycle of this in a minute, and then some portion of people go on to the more precancerous lesions. And this is just a little bit of an idea about what actually happens as one thinks about it. When one get, oops, sorry. As, as one gets infected, you get an initial HPV infection. It can be cleared. In some people, no one quite knows the percentage. It goes on to this early precancerous lesion, which can also clear. In some people, it goes on to continuing infection. But it's pretty clear you have to have continuing infection for a period of time before you could get on to the more serious lesions. And note the time frame here. This all happens pretty quick. Going to the more serious lesions typically can be, we say, zero to five years. But in practice, it really takes two to three years to go that way, and then up to 20 more years before cervical cancer. So it's what's actually happening to you or your children today that's going to really decide who gets cervical cancer 24 years or 20 years from now. So we know that, in fact, that there's a rationale for this disease. But the vaccine is actually prophylactic. So if you wait till you actually get HPV disease, there are some things people do. Uh, mostly they cut it out of your cervix when they see these precancerous lesions. There's other treatments as well. But the important point about this vaccine is it's a prophylaxis vaccine. Let's get it before you get infected. And if we can prevent that infection, we can prevent um, cervical, vaccine, uh, cervical cancer. So what are the key design questions? What type of vaccine do we need? What types of HPV should we include? Who should we study? How do we actually prove benefit? Okay, And these are really complicated questions. And I should say, as this program went forward at Merck, it, this program at Merck lasted 20 years, just to put it into context. And it's still ongoing today. There's probably going to be another 10 or 15 years of this particular program. So you can imagine what people ask me to do in my role is not to think about what happens today, tomorrow, and the next day, but where are we going to really be in 2020 or 2030 as we go forward? And we had to answer all these questions really definitively, quickly, cost effectively, and we had only one chance to get it right. In the end, you're going to hear that the Gardasil program had 25,000 um, patients in the particular trial. The actual cost of the trial approached about trials uh, in the program approached $1 billion as we went forward. And as you'll see, a good half of that money occurred before we even had any idea if a vaccine would work. 
So this is actually the, the molecule itself. Um, sorry, the vaccine itself, and it, it actually turns out to be a wonderful immunogen because the outside core proteins, the L1 proteins, self-assemble into something on the right that looks almost like a virus. So essentially what we inject into people, we vaccinate something that looks almost like the outer core. But it's not identical, in fact, to the, to the, to the virus. Oops, sorry, because the, because the virus itself, of course, has all the inner core, including the viral DNA, and, and the vaccine doesn't include any of that, so it's not infectious, and in that regard, it carries no risk of HPV infection. Now, we had to choose the types to put into the vaccine, and there's two such vaccines on the market. Um, GSK has a wonderful vaccine that looks at 16 and 18, and Merck has a wonderful vaccine that looks at 16 and 18 and 6 and 11. And 16 and 18 clearly are the ones that are caused the majority of the cancers. On the other hand, 6 and 11 cause many of the precancerous lesions and also the genital warts and the RRP as they go forward. And I can tell you that Merck, and possible it's true for GSK, isn't you know, sitting back at this particular point. This is a four-valent vaccine, but we currently have a nine-valent vaccine that's designed to add more and more types. And our hope is eventually the vaccine will get good enough that it doesn't prevent just 70% of cervical cancer, but it really starts to reach the kind of levels that PAP testing does, so we can really think about a new paradigm. We had to decide to test men versus women. In women, HPV disease is very well studied. Men were also important, and so what we decided to do was study women first, where we understood the biology, and then go on and study men. And we had problems with where to study this particular vaccine. So, this is actually a surrogate marker for HPV infection. You know, I told you that if, you, if you're a woman and you get HPV infection, it takes a while for those precancerous lesions to show up. And if you don't go to your gynecologist in practice, they may never show up. And so if you really want to understand when HPV infections occur, you can look at general, genital warts, because most people who have a genital wart actually go and talk to somebody about it, okay? And so if you actually look when genital warts are, um, are discovered, you can get some understanding about when people actually catch things. And if you take a look at this, okay, we decided to do our main efficacy trials in this period of time as well, this age group, people from 16 to 26 years of age. But of course, by that point, many people are actually infected. So as we did the trials, we were dealing with the fact that we couldn't provide prophylactic efficacy to all of those people. What we really wanted to do was to test it in adolescents. But we're hoping that the majority of adolescents, 10-year-olds, are not sexually active, and so you can't actually answer the scientific questions you want. Are people getting infected and going on to these lesions? And so what we did is we did the efficacy trials in this, this sort of um, young woman approach, and then we bridged the results back to adolescents, which is where we think the drug should really be used. But notice there's an awful lot of genital warts showing up on people who are greater than 25. And people often ask me, they say, who are these people who are, you know, at 30 and 35 and, and such are, are actually getting, getting genital warts and hence HPV infections? And you know, we could have a wonderful societal discussion about who those people are, but what this data shows is just because you turn 25 or 30 doesn't mean that you're still not at risk for getting HPV, uh, HPV disease. Now these trials are also complex in terms of how you actually decide what's HPV, what's an endpoint in these trials, right? We wanted to really show that this vaccine did things. And so I always love to show this slide where you can start in a biopsy up in the top left corner and see how you actually decided what a case was. This was a situation where somebody went, uh, you know, got their pap smear, it looked abnormal, they went and they looked at it under a microscope. You know, for those of you who don't know, they, the doctors can look at your cervix right under a microscope, see areas that look funny, take a little punch biopsy of that particular thing. In that particular case, it's actually curative for that particular precancerous lesion because we removed it. But they take these biopsies, section them in a very specific way, and on one hand, on the right side, certain slices would be used to really decide, did they actually have the lesion? Because it turned out that the, the, these trials are revolutionizing how we're actually looking at these biopsies, because no one's ever studied 25 million, 25,000 people where they could actually look at those biopsies and have careful review by panels of pathologists. On the left-hand side, they looked at PCR results. Is the virus there? Because there are other reasons where some of these lesions could occur. And a case was defined as you had the right pathology, agreed to by at least four pathologists, and on the right-hand side, you had to have at least two specimens that actually had the virus, so a pretty stringent um, uh, result. 
Now, of course, as with all pharma, one of the problems that you always face is how much money you're going to spend in this particular program. What would you like to know along the way that would help you that you're along the right track? So what we decided to do early on is to say to ourselves, we're going to do a proof of concept study. So the proof of concept study started back in the early 90s, actually, for Merck. And what we did is we didn't look to the right-hand side where we got to the really serious precancerous lesions. We looked to the left-hand side for the early efficacy. And what we actually did in that trial is we developed a single type vaccine, type 16. We treated 2,400 women for that for four years. And what we looked at to see is what actually happened and what did the vaccine do. Now I have to tell you something before we turn the slide, is that typically in these vaccine trials, when you're starting to really decide are you on the right track, it's sort of like those early cancer trials that Larry was talking about earlier today. What you're looking at is for signs that you're on the right track. No one's expecting to see great efficacy as you go forward. But in practice in this trial, we saw wonderful efficacy. I remember when this data came out at Merck, I was just getting started in the vaccine area. People just were shocked at this. If you start to look at some of these bad lesions here, these are the HPV 16 related, really precancerous lesions. The split was 12 to 0. Okay? The chance of that actually occurring isn't really defined over here, but it's well less than P less than 0. 0.00001, and you can keep adding zeros if you wanted to. On the other hand, our endpoint, which is this early infection, we were about 94% uh, effective. And what we actually did when we went back and we looked at these HPV 16 vaccine cases, why did the vaccine not get to even 100%? You could see how our mind shift was changing. You know, At the beginning, we would have been happy if 50% effect was seen. And then we started looking at this data, and pretty soon we were starting to wonder why we didn't get to 100%. We found that a majority of those cases were probably signs and symptoms that we hadn't really collected the samples right. And so those people, in fact, probably were previously infected, and we just didn't really know it. Now, of course, that was a proof of concept study. What you really have to ask yourself is, what do you want to know in order to say the vaccine actually does things? And so what you really want to know is you want to look at cervical cancer and say to yourself, we've prevented cervical cancer cases. So even though I've told you a 20-year story, we can't really do 20-year clinical trials. And that's how long it takes to look at the end state of, of cervical cancer. So after a lot of discussion that the FDA did and many others as well, we decided the last preclinical, premalignant lesion SIN23 was going to be the endpoints of the trials. And that's the one that the doctors, the gynecologists, actually take out of when they see a biopsy. So it's considered a curative process. We, did, we, we looked at broad populations. And I should point that out as well. Even though the trial is a prophylactic trial, in other words, we want to prevent people who are not infected, the FDA asked us, and we had decided ourselves as well, that it was important to look at the broad population. You don't want to know only just the women who are not infected. But you want to look at everybody as you go forward. And I'll show you the characteristics of that population um, in just a minute. Um, we picked our disease endpoints. We decided we were going to start with young adults, go to the adolescents, move to older women, and eventually to, to men. And we had a whole variety of endpoints. It listed just about every type of HPV um, related tumor that one could get. And so this was just the beginning of the program for Gardasil. It gives you some idea. Each of these, each of these represents somewhere between 1,000 and 5,000 patients. We then went on and did our adolescents, and eventually we did our males. Now, it's important to think about also how you're going to define what efficacy is. How do you know a vaccine works? And all of our primary data was in what's called a per-protocol population. It was the population of people who were 25 years of age, okay, or 20 years of age, but who were negative to that particular type of HPV at vaccine. So in other words, we're mimicking the 10-year-old adolescent. Okay? They had to have, be negative to that all the way through month seven until we gave the vaccine time to work. They had to receive all three doses. They had only started case counting, i.e., you could only count as a failure or success after month seven, and no major protocol violations. Now, that's a pretty stringent rule, OK? It, it does help you tell if your vaccine's going to work. But let's be honest, there aren't that many people who actually go out there and get the vaccination, show up for each visit on time, get all three of them, get tested at each group, OK, and actually follow everything that they're supposed to do as part of the vaccine schedule. So on one hand, we have this population, which is really not real life, but tells us what the vaccine could do if everything worked perfect. On the other hand, we have a second population, which we call an intention to treat population. Everybody who walks in the door doesn't matter what. 
And as you start to think about this vaccine, that's pretty important. Because walking in the door, people who are already infected, actually walking in the door, people already have the precancerous lesion and don't even know it at that particular moment. Do you have people who are infected with other types that are not in the vaccine? And so things start to get very messy when one looks at the intention to treat population, because that really is all comers. And then, of course, there's the time element in these trials. I told you it takes years sometimes for these lesions to develop. And so everything you see in the first six months of your vaccine trial, you know had to be there at the beginning, even if you can't prove it. It's only when you start to get out two, three, four years that you can begin to see the cases, sort of the holes in your data where you can see where, where cases had disappeared. So I'm just going to spend a minute on actually who was in the trial, because people always ask. This is sort of a subset of our trial, this is over here. And you can see that about the mean age was 20, 94% of these people were, um, were non-virgin. This is their average age of sexual debut. As one of the investigators in this trial, uh, I learned a lot more about how people initiate sexual debut than I ever would have wanted to know. Um, I, I have boys, thankfully. If I had a girl, I, I don't think I ever would have let her out of my house again in the future um, <laughs> as we go forward. Um, we, did, we did have a range of, of lifetime partners, uh, past pregnancies, contraception. Chlamydia is a marker for sexually transmitted disease. You can see, in fact, that uh, L-cell and H-cell are the people who walked in with lesions that you would see on pap smear. And you could also see a little bit about how many were positive as they walked in. And in fact, 27% of, of the women who walked in at that age already were infected at the time they came into the trial. But notice this is infected with one of the four types in the vaccine. In practice, well less than 1% were infected with all four types of the vaccines. So it's important to realize that among those 27 people were people who might have been infected with type 16, but not infected with type 18, so would have a real value from getting the vaccine as well. And this is just the efficacy in this, in this particular study. And, and I, I just love this. What can I tell you? OK, I'm a clinical scientist. This is what we live for. Um, it, there was 98% a reduction in the total number of HPV 16-related prophylactic uh, uh, lesions. And of the two that we actually had in Gardasil, honestly, both of them are probably confounded by infections with other types that were not in the vaccine. When we looked at the external genital lesions, these are the type 6 and 11 types, like the genital warts, you can see 227 in the, in the placebo group and two in the active group, 99% uh, you know, effect overall. But I did want to show one slide that I think it's important to put this into context. This is a little bit of data about one of our intentions to treat populations. There are many others, so this is all comers. And if you take a look at this, you can, oops, sorry, if you take a look at this, you can see the observed efficacy in this population is only 50%. Because remember, this included people who walked in already infected, potentially, and who went on for whom the vaccine couldn't work. And so one of the important messages we've had to get out about our vaccine, which no one seems to want to hear, is just because you got the vaccine, give it to your daughter, doesn't mean that two years from now, he, he if it's a boy, or she if, she, if it's a girl, isn't going to be called and get one of those pap test uh, calls and say, you have a lesion. It could be from a previously infected lesion, or it could be from a type that's not covered from the vaccine. So this vaccine doesn't prevent anything. It only works where it should, and it's really important to realize that everybody needs to continue all the surveillance efforts that you do with pap smears, et cetera. No one should let down their guard for a minute. All it's going to do is it's going to prevent the type 16 and 18 and 611 lesions that you can do. Now, we also studied men. And, and the men's studies were a lot harder because there is no equivalence to a pap smear in men overall. And we had to look at heterosexual men and men having sex with men as well because it turns out that quite a bit of HPV disease is particularly exacerbated in the gay community and especially exacerbated in those who have HIV. And so when we looked at it, we, we really looked at the extra genital lesions, the genital warts, and also the cancers as we went through this particular trial. And this is the result of the, of the males. We were just approved, actually, to give this vaccination in males. And what you can see is there's about 90% of efficacy on these trials. And in fact, what we really believe, but we cannot show, is, is that probably the three people in the vaccine group walked in already infected. Because without something like a pap smear, for example, to test who's actually infected, all you can kind of do is rub swabs around and 
unmentionable places in males, okay, and try to see if any HPV you know, disease is picked up. But in practice, you really don't know for sure who's infected or not. However, I think even more important is when we started looking at the cancer data, this is sort of an equivalent look at the same kind of lesions, uh, pre pre, uh, pre-malignant lesions, one sees in anal cancers, for example. And you can see, in fact, that there's clear vaccine efficacy. And if you start to get to the really precancerous lesions, the ones of most concern, the splits are eight to one. Not a large number of numbers, but, but still very, very encouraging. And the FDA has improved this for males for the extra general lesions. And we currently have the data in front of them about the anal cancers. And we'll see if they're as swayed by this as, as we are as well. Now, there are other populations that one could look at. I mentioned the adult women. We've done a huge trial in adult women as well. We call adult women 25 to 45. Um, I, I will laugh. When I entered that program, they were called mid-adult women. And when we went out and we did a little focus learning, I'm not a fo- you know, I, I have a very different view of life than, um, than, than some of our speakers from this morning. But we went out and we actually talked to people, do you like being called a mid-adult woman when you're 25 to 45? We got a very strong response to that, uh, that question. And so we've decided to talk about adult women as we go forward. And we have a lot of data that suggests this is very important as well in adult women. And that data is in front of the FDA. And we hope to get some of that data incorporated in the label. But in that place is an area where I think there's much more um, important questions raised about the cost benefit of that vaccine. The amount of disease is still smaller than in the young folks. And it's probably a little bit easier to pick out who actually might benefit from that vaccine. For example, it's certainly possible that uh, you know, uh, um, a 40-year-old woman who's been you know, married for 20 years and um, is uh, happily married in a monogamous relationship might not have much risk, in fact, for HPV vaccine, while somebody who's recently divorced and just joining the dating scene might have a different view. But I have to admit that my own view about this is very much colored about my experience in HIV as an infectious disease physician. I can't tell you how many young women I had to actually treat who had HPV disease from what was thought to be a, their happily married partner um, who wasn't so happily married at all and who brought back HPV vaccine into their particular relationship, which is, or, or, you know, is, a, is a horrible thing. So I, I must admit, from my personal point of view, I can't speak as Mark. There isn't anybody in this country at any age with any risk who shouldn't at least think about whether or not they should get this vaccine. Um, I do think, though, that there's probably one more uh, area where I'd like to really emphasize where the science is really developing. And I think that has to do with the, uh, with, with, um, let's see if I can get this to move forward, has to do with what's called OPSCC, which is oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma. It's really uh, cancers of the throat. And you know, when I was in medical school, if you look, uh, this is a bad slide, it didn't come out quite right, but if you look at that table and you look at the classic table, we were taught that that was, uh, um, that was a cancer of old men who smoke and drank and, and all that kind of stuff. And if you lived clean, you never got it. Um, the non-classical type, which is starting to overtake that, is, is really a very different type. It's people who are in their 40s and their 50s who have no other risk factors except for HPV vaccine, uh, HPV infection of the pharynx, who are actually developing large amounts of, of this particular throat cancer overall. And so Merck had hoped to, but isn't going to start yet, a, a trial that can actually show that uh, we can prevent this kind of HPV infection in the throat as well, and the vaccine may have some efficacy. Um, I just want to say a last couple of words. It, it, there are a few more slides, but I, there's really one or only one or two more topics I want to talk about, and that has to do with safety. Okay? Um, vaccines are a little bit different than most therapeutics. You know, if you have cancer, everybody understands why you have to take risk, because the risks you take are because you're sick, and this is a medicine that's going to make you better, and you might not like those risks, but that's what it's going to take to, to, really, uh, to really help you to get to that point. Um, vaccines are a little bit different, and so the amount of safety that we collect during the program and what we do after marketing is a really critical part of it. And the important part is you give vaccination to healthy individuals. In fact, in many parts of the world, you don't even have a choice if you get vaccinated or not. For example, in Australia, every, you know, every male and female is vaccinated with Gardasil. No ifs, ands, or buts, no excuses, no nothing. Um, but, but there is no immediate individual benefit. We, we, we vaccinate thousands of people to save hundreds of precancerous lesions, to save you know, five or 10 cancers, uh, cervical cancers as we go along, as opposed to therapeutics. And so evaluating the safety becomes particularly important. 
But it also gets harder in some ways because the risks for vaccination aren't the simple things. You know, if you take penicillin, 10% of you are going to get a penicillin rash, period. That's what happens. And so you don't have to treat a lot of people before you know whether that person is or is not, you know, penicillin is causing that rash. When you start to vaccinate people, you're going into lots of healthy people. And what really matters is how much more does the vaccine add to what's the pre-existing risk? And so this is a slide that we developed a number of years ago just to, to explain that idea. And I'll show you another example of it as well. If, if you actually vaccinate, you know, if you want to know how many cases of new onset diabetes occurs in a million young women, this is what will actually occur. As you do your trials, 150, or not your trials, but you vaccinate these people and you watch them in the large safety databases, 150 cases of new diabetes will show up. Okay? So if you go to those large safety databases and you say 170 of them, is that a vaccine effect? What if you see 500 of them or 1,000 of them? Okay? It becomes a lot more statistical in nature and much harder. And of course, for every single new person who develops vaccine, so all 150 of those people, okay, the mothers of those people, are going to are going to walk out feeling, you know, that vaccine might or might not have had something to do with my disease. And I, and I want to be very clear: I can't say at this point yet for many vaccines that they, that it couldn't happen. Okay, everything we do has a cost. No drug is safe. And no vaccine, no matter how much we try to make it safe, can we promise you that it has absolutely positively no side effects, even at the one, one in a million level. But what, what we do as public health people is we look at that in a very different way, and we look at the, 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 the benefit risks. And in this particular case, we only point out how difficult it is to actually value the safety of vaccines. And this is a very telling example that I actually lived through. Um, the blue line here um, is, is basically, um, the introduction of a vaccine, a pertussis vaccine, okay, that actually occurred during the uh, 60s and 70s in France. And the red, um, the red line that we're looking at is something ca called the incidence of SIDS, or sudden infant death syndrome. So I lived this personally myself uh, during the 80s when I was in training. And what you can see is, is they introduced in France in 1966 this new pertussis vaccine. In 1975, Pediatricians in France started encouraging their, you know, new mothers to lay their infants face down um, in their cribs. By 1980, okay, people thought that the vaccine was implicated in the cause of SIDS. Okay, and France actually wanted to take the vaccine off the market. And you can see why they feel that way. There's a perfect correlation between the years of 1970s and 1990s. Okay. But look what actually happened. In 1990, they changed the recommendations from, for pediatrics in terms of what you should do with SIDS, and the number of cases just dropped. Put your children on your back. The number of vaccine, vaccinated patients still continued, but the whole thing fell apart. Now, I, I, I want to be clear. The next time this could be a true story and not a, a false story, but it, it shows you the, the difficulties of interpreting things as we go forward. I'm running a little bit out of time, so I'm just going to really follow up with some of the pharmacovigilance and surveillance programs that we're actually doing overall. There's a huge effort to follow the safety of these vaccines um, as we go forward. There can be underreporting, overreporting, very hard to actually know the frequency of these adverse experiences or AEs as we call them in regulation speak, and the causality becomes really quite well. And I'd say that this is something that we share with the CDC and the FDA and the regulatory agencies all across the world. If anybody thinks that we're not taking this seriously, all of us, okay, they're sadly mistaken. But we all realize some of the limitations of the tools that we have to actually do. And so in this particular case, we're doing surveillance. Okay, Oops, did I build that right? Yep, surveillance. Merck currently is following, with the help of Kaiser Permanente, 200,000 actually individualized um, patients who are vaccinated to see what actually occurs, as well as pharmacovigilance as well. And this is not just happening in the US. It turns out that every regulatory agency thinks that their country is special. So we're doing it in France, we're doing it in the UK, we're doing it in the general EU, we're doing it in Australia, we're doing it in Japan, you name it. Every country has their own pharmacovigilance as well. In general, most of that data is very reassuring at this point. And overall, um, there's, there's strong agreement that the risk does outweigh the benefits. Now, of course, you don't only want to worry about the safety of a vaccine. You also have to worry about the efficacy. You know, a vaccine might wear off. 
you all know that you have to get a tetanus booster every five or 10 years, right? Everybody's heard that, right? You go into a, an emergency room and someone says to you, you know, geez, that's a nasty cut. When did you get your last tetanus? And if it's five years, they look at it and they say, it's a really bad cut, we'll give you the booster. And if it's 10 years, they say, well, you gotta get it no matter what kind of cut it is. It's been very hard actually with vaccines to understand when that next moment for a booster is with tetanus, which is a very safe vaccine. They just give it to you just in case you want to have an argument in that emergency room, there's essentially no data that says you need a booster every five to 10 years for tetanus. It's just that tetanus is a, you know, is a horrible disease if you get it and the shot is cheap and you know, emergency room doctors have decided it's better to give the shot up too many times than to have cases of tetanus. With guard cells, it's a little bit more complicated because we're giving this to girls who are 10, okay? And yet we all know they're gonna be 20 when they really need it. And they're probably still gonna need it at 30. And so what we're doing actually is we're doing a very interesting long-term follow-up study where we took the individuals who were in some of the large phase three trials. We set up a registry in Denmark, Iceland, and Norway because in those countries, every pap smear and biopsy has to go into a central registry. There is no losses. And we're following that cohort out ahead. So what we're doing every year is we're looking to see is the expected number of cases in those patients who got GARDA still starting to increase over time so that we're gonna have a three to four year lead time to be able to say, is this vaccine wearing off and are we gonna to have to give people boosters? Now I should point out, we've gone out seven or eight years, see absolutely no sign of that so far. Even more importantly, this vaccine uh, elicited what's called immune memory which basically means a sort of an amnestic, a, a memory response, so that in practice, when you actually get exposed to it, a huge jump in immunogenicity occurs quite rapidly. And as a result of that, we're not expecting that we're gonna to have to booster at all, but data is data, and over the next 10 or 15 years, we're gonna learn the answer to that as well. So just to finish up with my last two or three slides, the conclusions are there's high efficacy with Gardasil for many different types of cancers. The efficacy really applies to both men and women. The risk benefit remains overwhelmingly positive as one goes forward. And it's really a remarkable 10 to, 10 to 20 year story of success so far. And I think really the best is yet to come because so far what we've done is we've put a marker down. We've made a bet on the future. I think it's a, an important bet. But the bet is, is that over the next couple of years, the cancer rates are gonna start to drop. And if you start to do some projections about when would we actually see this, Okay, if you start vaccination in 2007, the impact on HPV infections in teenage girls shows up within a year. The incidence on genital warts a year after that. The impact on sin, the precancerous lesions, takes five to six years to really look at. And it's well out beyond 2020 that you have any hope of seeing any effect on cervical cancer. But I will tell you, I'm gonna show you just one last slide Okay, I do think that there's really some encouraging data that this story is going to be true. And this is a complicated slide, and I wanna be clear, it doesn't prove anything, but I love looking at it because it gives me hope for the future. Um, so in Australia, they've been doing HPV surveillance for years and years and years, looking at national genital warts. I have no idea why they decided that 30 years worth of surveillance of genital warts was an important way to spend their public health money, but they've been doing it. And what you can see here is, you can see the curves for a variety of different groups. Each of these lines represents a different group. Women 28, greater than 28, men who have sex with men, men who have sex with women. Um, I don't even know what that one stands for anymore, okay? Um, um, but what you can see is almost all of these are remarkably constant over time with a little bit of up and down motion, okay? All right, the one that's different is this one, okay? It sort of was climbing and whatever and vaccination started and during the course of the next two years or a year and a half, the number of genital warts in that population, which is women less than 28, just plummeted. It's well less than half of what it was in previous years, okay? And of course, it did happen, coincidental, with the mandatory requirement that all women under, in this case, under, under 20, I think, in Australia, who had to receive the uh, HPV vaccine. And so I don't know yet whether the next year this particular line is gonna take a statistical jump upwards, but I'm hoping that each year as we continue to gather information, it'll continue going downward. Genital warts are the lead 
for the rest of the kinds of infections we're talking about because they're so overt. So that means in a couple of years, we'll, we would see lines like this and the precancerous lesions. And actually, I think Australia is well on its way to really doing uh, its best to eradicate the 70% of cervical cancer that are caused by types in the vaccines. And I think I'll stop there. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Keith. We're going to open the floor to questions. Uh, so we'll follow the routine. Oops, we have a question here. Why don't you quit? Oh, need a microphone? Thank you, Keith, for a wonderful talk. This isn't a question. I wanted to add another dimension to this talk, mm -hmm. in the, and it had to do with the slide that Larry showed at the beginning of this meeting, the quote from Tolstoy about keeping an open mind about science and medicine. In the 19, during the decade of the 1970s, I was studying a bacterial virus in France, and I used to go to all of the virology meetings, the European virology meetings, and at every meeting, at the end of the meeting, Harold Zerhausen would give a talk on the correlation between HPV and cervical cancer, and for a decade, nobody paid any attention Absolutely. to it. Absolutely. I think that's really true, and I, I think it does uh, point out sometimes how, how important it is to fund basic science as one, one goes forward. But I also have to give a lot of credit. This isn't for me. There was a period of time where people started to take a chance on that. If we had waited till that correlation became absolute, this story never would have happened. We'd be just starting the story a few years ago. What it really took is some far-sighted people who said, I'm willing to take a bet on this. And that's really what it was. And it was an expensive bet by us and by many others to say, this is really compelling. You know, I told you this was a story of, of passion. And what I haven't told you is the story of the individuals involved who really stood up at that particular moment at Merck. Remember, at a place like Merck, we have hundreds of projects that are fighting for funds. It reminds me of the NIH when I used to put my grants in it. We're just a little more civil about it, and our grant applications are a little smaller. Okay? But otherwise, the same kind of things happen, and those people came, and they fought for this. And, and, uh, and in fact, I think it's remarkable that they won, and I'm proud to be part of that. Question over here? Larry, I think there's a good chance you're going to ask the same question I was going to ask. But since you inspired me to ask this question, why don't you go first? <laughs> OK. We'll find out. You were, you were a shill for this. That's so fantastic. Well, no, I'm just guessing. But this well, I actually have two questions. The second one is the harder one. Okay. The one that he's talking about, which is my second question, our second question, apparently, is <laughs> for you to uh, say a little bit about the difference between this Australian mandatory vaccination program and, say, a state like uh, Texas. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so when you get around to that, I want you to do that. And my real question, the real question, is to, to help ask you to share with us how a company like Merck has the, the kind of, I want to coin a phrase. So you coined a phrase, pharmacovigilance, which I never heard before. So I want to do one called pharmaco ROI, return on investment, because these trials take forever. They must be extraordinarily expensive. And the chance that Merck will make a gazillion dollars as opposed to a hundreds of millions or a billion on a vaccine of this kind compared to treating cervical cancer as a chronic disease for the next 50 years when you're sin one, two, or three, it strikes me that it's wonderful, but I'd like to understand it more, okay? So let me take your second question first, because you're, uh, you're right, in some ways it's, I don't know if it's harder or easier, but in some ways a little bit more straightforward. Um, you know, pharma companies are made of people, okay? And, you know, there's this feeling that, that pharma companies are this monolithic, you know, profit-making machine out there, and that all we really want to do is jack up the price of drugs and, and make a gazillion dollars and whatever. But, but the pharma companies are really me, okay? You know, Merck is 100,000 me's, okay? Well, they're not all me. Some of them are smarter, <laughs> but that's a different question, okay? But people who care in the same way, okay? And I think that's actually true for most pharma companies as you go forward, just like it is for most biotech companies and most people who make diagnostics. <laughs> the money is a nice thing, okay? It's really what funds our next generation of things going forward. But what people are really there for is the passion. They want to make a difference. You know, I was a professor at Columbia for a number of years, and I came to Merck because I felt like what I could do in a year at Merck it would have taken me 30 years to do a Columbia where I was studying gene expression and immunology, okay? And I, you know, my whole department is filled with people like that. And so I think what companies like this do is they, they struggle with how much they can put or they can invest in what they think is their calling versus what they need to do to make sure that 
that they're going to be delivering to our shareholders. And those are, these are, those are not the, the same thing. But I, as, as time goes on, it, it, my experience is, Mark, is, is I think it's become clearer to me that if we can actually make money from what we do, and we don't make nearly as much money as we used to. So I, I love it when people beat me up. My profit margins aren't 50% anymore, OK? Nowhere close. Um, in practice, I think much of that money feeds back into the R&D budget and really funds the projects of the future. And so I think in a lot of times, what we really have to ask ourselves is, of, is you know, how do we balance those two? And sometimes it's easy. Works in the cardio, works in the cardiovascular arena, costs a, a billion dollars to develop a drug. But you know, if you win, you have billion dollar sellers. But we also have a whole portfolio of drugs we know darn well are gonna cost 100 or $200 million to develop. And in the end, if we break even on those, we're gonna be happy, okay? Now that doesn't mean we're not gonna make some money in those later years, but if you think about what we had to invest before we knew versus what we're gonna get at the end. And like every pharma company, there's a portfolio of those things. And I think different companies have different characters in terms of how much they're willing to do it. Personally, I think all that's happening in the outside space is actually making it harder for places like Mark. When I came, the medical need was, was you know, on a scale, was clearly the thing that tipped stuff. Today, because we get speed up so much, I think actually society's doing themselves a disservice because companies like Merck actually have to make harder decisions that often say programs like ours couldn't happen in the future because we're under pressure about our prices and our access and other kinds of things. Now that's a very self-centered view and many people could disagree with it, but I think that's true. Let me say a word about Texas, okay? Um, or about uh, Colorado or wherever your favorite state may be. Um, I don't think it's Merck's job, and I don't think it was Merck's job, to tell any state or any parent what they should do about vaccination, okay? As a public health person, as an individual, I also vehemently disagree with that, okay? But I'm talking about what Merck should do. Merck should say, we have a product, and this product delivers X, and we want you to really understand what that value is, and we're gonna do everything possible to help you understand why you should utilize that individual product. And that's where it should stop. And all the important societal things should be really decided by society. Unfortunately, I'm an individual as well. And so if you ask my personal view as a public health advocate, I think that's among the stupidest things that Americans have ever decided to do. I didn't say people shouldn't legit legitimately agree with me, but HPV disease isn't gonna be stopped person by person. We've learned that the story of vaccines are that you have to get enough people under control, sort of the herd effect, or otherwise people are always gonna slip through the, loop, you know, through, the, through the loop and they're gonna actually go on and the HPV is gonna continue to be a problem overall. And the best way is not to try to get every, you know, H is to get every individual, boy or girl, if you decide this is important enough, okay, and I personally believe it's important enough, and that countries like Australia are really doing it the right way. They truly are gonna cut down on their cervical cancer rate. And in America, where the penetration of this vaccine is really still quite low um, in practice, even though, for example, there is no one who should be able to get it without funding because Congress provides funding for those who can't afford it. Um, in practice, um, it's still very low, and I think it's gonna be decades before we reach the point where the impact that we're seeing in Australia might really occur. So again, that's a very personal view, not a mark view. You didn't ask the question. <laughs> oh, okay. But you were just moving in that direction. Obviously, living in Colorado and listening to the radio occasionally, um, Gardasil, a great example of an obviously great vaccine, does many, many wonderful things, that has received tremendous resistance. Mm -hmm. And you just said you don't believe it's Merck's job to get into the business of social change, perhaps, or social change perception, but I'm in that business. So I'm interested in, and, and this ties into a little bit about what we heard yesterday about the barriers to adoption, the impediments out there, and society is a big one. So when we have something wonderful that seems to make sense, but is getting a lot of resistance that doesn't necessarily seem to make so much sense, what do you think we should do about that? Well, I wish I had the answer to that question, and I don't, not a, a clue, okay? Um, and believe me, it isn't as if lots of people within Merck and in many other areas of biomedical research aren't really thinking about that question. 
you know, I turn on the TV and I see scare stories about Gardasil every day, okay? I want to scream at the press. And yet, yet, you know, I really do believe that a free press writing about what they should do is really one of the foundations of this country. And so I'm really torn as I actually face that. I actually think that every single parent should actually get their child, you know, vaccinated by Gardasil. But I'll be, you know, to be, I'll be honest, if someone came to me and said, you must get vaccinations, no ifs, ands, or buts in, in an area where, you know, in a, in a related area where I had, you know, less public health understanding and view, I probably would stand up as well. It's one of the, the, to the tensions and dynamics of being an American today. I mean, I know I sound like a presidential candidate when I say things like that. Um, but, but it is a, a fine line that we really walk trying to understand what are we going to do to allow people to make choices and what are we going to do as a company, as a nation, to really help support those things. I think the hardest thing is how much misinformation there is. So this morning when you talked about the fact that 70 or 80 percent of people, 60, 70 percent, believe that what they read on the web is true, I go out every day and I read what people say about Gardasil. Okay? There are wonderful true things and there are things that are so blatantly false I don't know what to say. And so it is very frustrating for someone like me who actually thinks that this is not a perfect product but an extraordinary advance in medical science that we can possibly cure a cancer by a vaccine um, really is something that needs to happen. And a lot of what I do is I talk to people in the same way I talk to you guys here today. So I was grateful that Larry allowed me to come because if even five of you in this room walk out of this saying, you know, I wasn't sure if I was going to get my daughter vaccinated, but I'm going to go home and do it. And even get as far as the first shot, because usually by the third shot, it starts to wear off, okay, you know, that, that enthusiasm. I feel like the whole trip out here was worthwhile. It's, it really is a nice story. And um, it occurred to me that perhaps there is a connection with personalized medicine in a way, sort of from the virus perspective. And what, what often happens with vaccines like this, and yours is a four-valent vaccine, is that eventually as the vaccine is used, and this one was launched only a few years ago, you get an increase in prevalence of the serotypes that are not covered by the vaccine. And so there's a four, there will be a nine, which is in a development. And do you have a sense for whether that shift is beginning to occur? And, and how does one think about conversion from four to nine, given that the immunization is quite long term? Yeah, it's an excellent question. Um, and thanks for bringing it up. So in the vaccine community, that's a very hotly debated issue. It's called replacement is the technical name that we use for that. And there are very clear examples where that's occurred. The pneumococcal um, vaccine is one where we know that it's made an extraordinary impact in, in young kids going forward. But we can already see that new types are starting to appear in kids that were not in the original vaccine. It's one of the reasons, for example, a, a broader vaccine has been really brought out. Um, there, there's a lot of science to support that for HPV, that doesn't occur. Um, and a lot of it has to do with the competition. So for example, when people are infected with pneumococcus, generally they're infected with one or two types in their nose. That's often the reservoir. And people just don't have many more types than that. It's a lot more complicated than that. I'm giving the simple version. You probably could tell that story better than I could, actually. Um, um, but in practice, um, if you don't have the usual ones, something comes in to fill its place because there seems to be an empty niche. With HPV, there does not seem to be a niche. So what we learned in our trials, I didn't talk about it today, is there are people who are infected with one, two, three, four, five, six, ten 10 HPV types. Now, I don't really want to ask what those people with 10 HPV types have been doing in the last couple of months. But in practice, um, it's a very common thing. And it seems to be no problem at all. Over time, they can clear some, keep some going, et cetera. And so at least from the science that we understand of how this virus works, there's no reason why replacement should occur. Having said that, it's a really hot topic. And in all these long-term studies, I didn't mention it, it isn't a matter of just saying the vaccine is safe and it works. We're continuing to take specimens from those folks and really enumerating what actually is there. So what we're looking at is exactly that, which is if these women get Gardasil, are they seeing increasing amounts of type 31 or 45 or 56? So far, seven years out, we've seen no hints at all that that actually occurs. So the main reason we're going from four to nine in the future is that we can say we're not protecting only against 70% of the types that cause cervical cancer, that it's going to be 87%. But you know what? When the time comes, we're going to have to prove that you know, we're not eroding things off the bottom 
Okay, and what we're doing is we're still protecting 70%, but it's a slightly different 70% going forward. So thanks. One, one more question. Yeah, okay. very, very briefly, I wonder if perhaps the, the way of overcoming the resistance domestically is with a, with a great success story you know, out there. So you haven't mentioned Brazil, the country with the highest rate of HPV. Do you guys have a, a trial there? How is it going? I mean, that's, that's topping off the charts in cervical cancer. That will be a great poster child. Yeah, so I, I, can't, I can't confirm or deny that Brazil is the highest because I just don't know. I do know that in practice, most of the places where we've seen the highest rates are actually in the developing world like Africa and the poorer parts of Asia. So Brazil certainly doesn't fall into that category anymore, but it may in, in fact have extraordinarily high rates. These studies were done worldwide, for example. Actually, a majority, I, I, the slide's not up there, but probably about a quarter to a third of the patients actually came from Latin America who were in these trials. So that, in fact, we, what we wanted to be able to do is to say to the Latin American people, the African, the Asians, et cetera, these results seem to be applicable to everywhere. I think the biggest problems we've really faced in most, and, and actually, we've done a remarkable demonstration project, in, I think it's in Costa Rica, We've essentially vaccinating the whole country there in conjunction with the, uh, the, the, um, the uh, Ministry of Health. I'm not sure I have the country right, so please take that as a sort of a directional comment. And uh, we don't really have any data back from that, but what the purpose of that was not necessarily to get efficacy data, but to try to figure out how to deliver this vaccine in a little bit more of a third world setting. And I think the biggest problem that we've really had with delivering this vaccine in a third world setting, honestly, is the cost. The vaccine sells for about $350 here in the U.S. for all three shots, okay? Um, everybody can argue with me about whether that's the right price or not, but it actually costs somewhere on the range, and again, I, it's hard to say this exactly, about $25 to $50 just to make the vaccine. And the reason I bring that up is because we designed it in such a way that was scientifically correct, but wasn't able to solve the problem that someone brought up this morning of, you know, how do you put the minimum technology into this so you can kind of deliver it in the simplest way without a cold chain, all that kind of stuff. We're working very hard to solve that problem, but we haven't fully solved that yet. So the biggest problem in the developing world is, how do we get this to the people who need it at the right cost going forward? Now, having said that, Merck recently endowed a, a very large program in neglected diseases, the Hillman Center, which is set up in India. Um, and one of the projects they're taking on, among others, is this issue of how do we make this vaccine in such a way that it can actually be made much more cheaply and simply, and should we find new partners so we can actually bring it into places like India, where there are literally hundreds of millions of people who need it and the countries can't afford it. Yeah. Just a question uh, or comment, really, that Judging from what Pat said about advocacy and awareness and your data on Australia, why not use Scott Danielson uh, yeah. to, to bring forth the message that is a forcing function uh, for, the, for America? Yeah, it, this is a little bit of a problem. Nothing to do with Scott or Pat. Um, Merck, Merck can't say things like Pat said. I wish I could, honestly. Okay, I'm coming as close as I possibly can. I didn't have to put up my forward-looking statement, you know, that we usually put up in these things because this is a scientific meeting. But I actually had an argument with my lawyer as to whether that's true. And once or twice today, I was very careful to tell you what I believed as opposed to what Merck would believe. Um, Merck has many limits on what it can or cannot say, what it can do, and how it can do things. And those are very important limits that the FDA and our law set upon us. So we have to be very careful that we make sure that the messages we give are entirely consistent with what the FDA says that we can say. And while I wouldn't, I wouldn't say we've ever slipped up on that, because we have, okay? In general, Merck is really committed to the idea that we're not gonna only follow the letter, but the spirit of that law, okay? And we're not going to make statements that, uh, you know, that aren't acceptable in terms of, of things. So the kind of work that Scott does some of that would really fall, not all of it by any means, but some of it would actually fall under things that Merck is not legally allowed to do. And it's also why I can't stand up as, as a Merck specimen and go out of a scientific meeting where I'm not presenting data and actually give talks about why everybody should get a vaccination. So when I talk to my kids' high school, I, I can't say at the end, you should all go and get vaccinated. I want to, okay? I, do, I look them straight in the eye and I do everything I can to, to make sure they get that message, but I'm legally not allowed to do that. And so there are some limits about that. You need third-party advocacy groups to engage Scott. Uh, obviously, you know, Pat has other things on her mind that she should really be focusing on. But I, I would personally be very pleased 
If we had somebody who felt as strongly about HPV disease as Pat does about muscular dystrophy, and I should point out there are, in fact, groups of people out there who are doing it. I don't think quite as effectively, but you know, and, but you know once, we get, once Merck helps them, if Merck gives them a grant, okay, they're, they're tainted at that point in the present climate. And so in practice, what we have to do is to say to them, we support everything you do, but, but we're not going to give you a, a dollar to, even though we think this is a good idea, because in the end, it, it really ends their credibility. And so we really do walk a fine line. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much, Keith. Uh -huh.